Good morning and welcome to Ridge Point Church. Why don't you stand and worship with us? Praise is the 
need you Soften my heart And break me apart I need you To open my eyes To see that you're shaping my what you say that you're good and your love is great i'm broken inside i give you my life i need you in my heart and break me apart I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me all I am I surrender We 
It's your breath in our lungs. We know that we are able to breathe today because you allow us to breathe. We know that anytime that 
we open our eyes in the morning, it's because you have allowed us to wake up. God, we just, we, just we, we know and we thank you that every good thing in this world comes from you. Every blessing in this world comes from you and only you, God. And we thank you for that. We ask that your blessing be upon this service. That if, if there may be someone here today that doesn't know you, God, that you'll, that you'll touch them and you'll speak to them and you'll breathe the breath of life into their lungs for the first time. And we just ask all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is great to see you guys today. Welcome to Ridgepoint Church. It's good to have you guys with us today. And also to everyone that's joining us online, welcome uh, to Ridgepoint Church. It is great to have you guys again. Before we go any further, I just want to say something. Um, our band and our vocalists, they always just do such a phenomenal job leading us to God. I just want to thank them in this moment. Can we just show them some thanks? And here, here's what I want to say, and um, this has just kind of been on my heart lately because all of our folks do everything that they possibly can with the talents that God has given them. They do it in excellence, okay? And so, but they know, here's what I want to say. They know it's not about the lights. I think our lights are pretty cool. It's just my feelings. I think our lights are pretty cool, but it's not about the lights. It's not about what you see up front here. It's not even about the sound, but everybody that's serving up front here and everyone that's serving back in the back on what we call media row, all those folks use their talents to the best of their ability to worship God. Okay, and they do it with excellence. And so if you can do this, if you can, as much as you can do, they want to do what they do for God. And so today, we're all about experiencing transforming relationships here at Ridgepoint Church that lead us closer to God and closer to each other. And that's what all this is for. I just want you guys to, I just wanted to say that out loud today. Uh, I like the lights. I think they're pretty cool, but it's not about the lights. It's not about the sound. It's not about the look. It's all about Jesus and helping us grow closer to him. And I just want to say that today. Listen, we're starting something new today that I'm pretty excited about. And uh, if you're new to Ridgepoint Church, or maybe today's the first time that you've been with us, or maybe the first day today's the first day that you're tuning in with us online, uh, we're starting this new series called Greater Reward. Just by show of hands, or maybe just an emoji online if you're watching on Facebook or church online, just by show of hands, how many of you guys made New Year's resolutions back in January? Show of hands. Anybody? Okay, like six of you. Excellent. I don't know why. I thought there were going to be more people. Nobody does it anymore because we know we can't do it, right? Show of hands, show of hands, how many of you actually uh, are still doing your new, res new Year's resolution? One. Okay, excellent. Nobody else. There was one person in the, in the earlier service as well. Here's another thing, and maybe some of you guys can relate to this. How many of you make the same New Year's resolution every January, hoping you're going to stick to it this year? Right? There's a few of you. Exactly. I can totally relate to that. As a matter of fact, just like 2020, 2019, 2018, every single year I feel like I'm saying, I'm going to lose weight this year. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do it. Funny story, uh, this past week, Saturday, I just had enough. I just felt so just just like I just needed to lose weight. And my wife and I, we went up to Walmart and I picked up some Slim Fast and I thought, this is it. This is the thing. This is what's going to help me lose weight. By Wednesday, I was out of Slim Fast, and I was back to eating whatever I wanted. So it's just it just doesn't work sometimes. It just doesn't work. We're so good at making goals for our lives, aren't we? We're so good at making goals and these ambitious things that we say we're going to do, and somehow it just doesn't turn out the way that we want it to turn out. Some other folks around here are like, listen, I want to be debt-free in the next five years. I want to be debt-free, and so I'm going to do everything possible to be debt-free. 
Other folks are like, listen, I want to have a better marriage. I don't want to fight with my spouse. And so I'm going to do everything in my power to not argue with my spouse. And I'm going to get along with my wife or my husband. And we're going to do this thing. I want a healthy marriage, right? You make these ambitious goals, these things that, that are pretty far out there. But, but you think, I can totally do this. I can totally do this. Unfortunately, within a few days, sometimes weeks, sometimes even months, the momentum just kind of wears out, doesn't it? The momentum is just kind of gone, and we're just kind of there like, I'm getting ready to fail. It's getting ready to happen. I'm getting ready to give in. I'm going to eat that Twinkie this week. It's just going to happen. I'm just going to do it, right? Or you just had an argument with your wife, and you're like, it's just not going to work. I just can't do this. I can't do this. Your energy, your momentum fade. I don't know if any of you guys do this or not, but some of you probably go to the gym a lot. And, and sometimes it's just so much easier going to the gym because you're around a lot of other people and you're like, I'm going to show them I can do this and I'm going to run faster than they run. I'm going to wait. I'm going to lift more weights than they can lift. I'm just going to do that because the momentum's there. There's more people around you. Then you get home. Your momentum starts to wane. Your willpower starts to wane. And those things start happening. And you're like, I just can't do this. This is really really hard. Why is it so often that we want to change? We truly want to change. We have good intentions, but we find it so hard and so difficult to actually make the change. Why is that? What I want to do over the next three weeks is I want us to consider the greater reward. I'm going to explain more about that as we go throughout the service today. We're going to start today by looking at this guy. If that was you, if I stepped on your toes any at all during that first little section, I just want you to know that this guy that we're going to talk about today, he knows where you're coming from. He knows where you're coming from. As a matter of fact, this guy, this guy is even going to make you feel better about yourself. This guy truly understands what you're going through. The Apostle Paul. Listen, he was close to God. The Apostle Paul, he even he literally saw the risen Christ. The Christ appeared to him. He saw the risen Christ. He was close to God. He had an amazing ministry. As a matter of fact, he wrote over a third of the New Testament, of what we read today. He wrote over a third of the New Testament. This guy was super, super close to God. If there's anybody in Scripture that I'm trying to strive to be like other than Jesus, it's like, I want to be like Paul. I want to help these people. I want to write letters to all these people just encouraging them and calling them out whenever they're doing wrong and just helping them grow closer to God. This guy had it going on, right? That's the Apostle Paul. Yet, in Romans, in chapter 7 of Romans, check out what Paul says. It's interesting. He says this, I don't really understand myself. I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do, I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I just can't. I just can't do it. I can't seem to do it. I want to do what's good, but I don't do that either. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do that anyway. Then he goes on to say, oh, what a miserable person that I am. Who's going to free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I don't know about any of you guys, but man, that just strikes a chord inside of me. I want to do right. I want to do good. I want to so bad. Why is it that I keep messing up? Why is it that I keep doing the wrong thing? Who can save me from myself? I don't know about any of you guys, but I can totally relate to that. Listen closely. What I want to do today, here's here's very simple. What I want to do today is I want to talk about this word that I believe has gotten a bad rap. It's gotten a bad rap in society today, probably in your own mind. And the, the word I want to talk about today is discipline. Discipline. A couple of you have already turned me out, or tuned me out. You're like, I'm not talking about that. I already know I'm not a disciplined person. I can't do it, Clayton. Just don't even ask me to. I'm just tuning out at this point. Listen, I understand, and I'm going to admit to you today that as your pastor, there are lots of areas in my life where I, I need more discipline. No question. More discipline, nor more discipline. It's a struggle for all of us. And I, here's what I want to do, though. Here. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you a very simple definition for the word discipline that we're going to use today for today's purposes, okay? Hear me out. The definition for the word discipline for today's purposes is choosing what I want most 
over what I want now. Choosing what you want most over what you want now. It's pretty simple, right? Many of us want the same things, or many of us want similar things, right? Uh, If you're married, you want a good, healthy marriage. Like, I don't know anyone that says, hey, I want to be divorced four times before I'm 40. Nobody says that, right? Many of us want to live financially secure. We want to be able to help people. We don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. I don't know anybody that says, hey, just give me enough money to get me by this week, and then I'll worry about next week. Nobody says that, right? We want the same things. We want to be financially secure. We want to be healthy. Nobody wants to worry about their weight. I don't want to worry about my weight, but it just keeps coming. I don't understand where it comes from, but it just keeps coming. I don't want to have to worry about it. So we all want similar things. Why is it that we all get different results? Why is it that we get different results? Why do we end up with different results? We want the same things, but we need to recognize something very important. Desires don't determine who you become. Can I say that again? Desires don't determine who you become. Discipline determines who you become. Right? In other words, hoping for a better life doesn't bring you a better life. Habits that honor God will bring you a better life. So why is it perhaps, why is it perhaps that we all want similar things? We all want to be more disciplined in many ways, but we just keep failing. We just keep falling. Why is it that we try so hard, but we just keep falling short? One of the reasons that I want to declare to you today that you might turn your head on me on, here's here's what I think. Willpower doesn't work. Willpower doesn't work. You want it to. I want my willpower to work. I really do so bad. But over time, willpower is like a muscle. When you work it too hard, it just gets worn out. Just gets super worn out. Gets tired. You know what? You can handle. You can handle your coworker bringing that donut in the first of the morning, and you can say, "I'm not gonna eat that donut." But when your belly starts growling, all of a sudden, two hours later, you've already eaten three of them. That's just the way it works, right? Your willpower it just weakens over time. It starts to wane and weaken. Once you start getting hungry, you just can't pass up that donut. It just looks so good. Willpower doesn't work for long because it starts. To weaken or wane. And that's a real problem for Jesus followers, isn't it? It's a super real problem if you're a Jesus follower. Because if you're a Christian, we know we're supposed to do good, right? We know this. It comes along with the with the title. If we're a Christian and we're a child of God, we're supposed to do good. That's how we honor God. We're not supposed to do bad. As a matter of fact, we don't lie, do we? We don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't steal. We don't flip people off whenever they're doing 44 in a 55 speed zone on a two-lane road. We don't do that, do we? We don't go into Billy Ray's in the afternoon on Sunday and get mad at the waitress and start yelling at her because she gets our orders wrong. We don't do that, do we? Liars. You're all liars. <laughs> we do that all the time. All of us, we read our Bibles every day. As a matter of fact, every one of us that call ourselves Christians, we wake up at 6 o'clock every single morning. We go into the kitchen. We sit down at the table. We read our Bibles. We pray multiple times throughout the day. We eat right. We, we say what's right. We talk to God, and we, we're super generous with all of our funds. Aren't we? All of us can say that, can't we? Negative. That is not us. And why is that? Why is it so hard? So hard for us. Eventually, our sinful desires overtake our waning or weakening power. It just happens. Our sinful desires sometimes win out. Before you know it, you give in. And then, as soon as you give in, you can't believe you just did that. Like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I feel so bad. Have you ever noticed that before you fail or before you fall, uh, before you commit that big sin, have you ever noticed uh, that the devil starts to tell, tell you, it's no big deal, not a big deal, don't worry about it because everybody else does it too, and they don't, they're not even going to know. No one's even going to know that you do this. So no big deal. You're doing it in private. No one's ever going to know about it. Other people do it. No one's ever going to know. It's not even a big deal. And that's what the devil tells us. He, he, he whispers that to us all the time before we fail before we fall, before we commit that big sin. Before you do it, your spiritual enemy, the devil, he tries to minimize the consequences of any kind of wrongdoing. Just what he does. He tells us it's not a big deal. But after you fail, 
after you fall, after you commit that sin or that thing that you knew you shouldn't have done to begin with, but the devil keeps telling you it's okay, it's not a big deal, it's not a very big sin, as soon as you fail, what does that same voice tell you? What's the same voice in your head tell you? You're such a bad person. You're such a bad person. You're such a failure. Are you even a Christian? Like, why would you do that? Why would you allow your, you're a failure. Like, why would you, you're worthless. You're a bad person. The same voice that minimized it when um, he then connects it to your identity. The same one that minimizes it connects it to your identity and tells you that you're never going to change. Look what you did, man. You did it again. You said you wasn't going to do it, and you did it again. The same one. You're such a bad person. You're a failure. The same one that minimized that sin before you did it, he now connects it to your identity and tells you that you're never going to change. Guys, this is important. I need you to hear me on this. I need you to hear me. The key to really changing, the key to really changing starts with your identity. The key to changing starts with your identity. When the Apostle Paul was struggling in the verses that we read earlier, you can see the root of his problem was an identity problem. The root of it, he said this, Oh, what a miserable person that I am. What a wretched person. I'm such a bad person. I'm such a miserable person. What he's saying is, this is just who I am. This is just who I am. It's an identity problem that he has. Because I'm bad, because I'm a bad person, inevitably, I can't do what I really want to do. I can't change because I'm bad. And that's Paul's dilemma that he's having. I end up doing the wrong thing. I end up doing what I know is wrong because I'm a bad person. Pastor Craig Rochelle, who is a, a wonderful, wonderful person, preacher and, and communicator, he calls this cycle, he calls this the cycle of shame. And this is how it works. The foundation of the cycle of shame starts with this identity, this identity that says, I am bad. That's where it starts. That's the foundation, right? You can see it on the screen. He says, I am bad. Because we think that by our nature, we are bad, what are we going to do? Because we think we're bad, we're going to try really, really, really. If you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian. You know that you're a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus. If we, know, we think that we're bad and we identify as being bad, we try really, really hard. Right? We try really, really hard. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to eat that donut. I, I'm going to try really, really hard to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to read my Bible. I'm going to try really, really hard to want, not watch TV at night, but, but just go ahead and pray to Jesus and then go to sleep. I'm going to try really, really hard to do these things. Because we think that we are bad by our nature, we try really, really, really hard. And guess what? Sometimes we find some success in that. Sometimes we find success in trying really hard really hard. But in our own strength, in our own power, we don't have it in us to do that for an extended amount of time. Eventually, our willpower weakens. And that's the next part of the cycle. Our willpower weakens. We try really, really hard, and then our willpower starts to weaken. And it's just so difficult to maintain. Before you know it, we inevitably, inevitably, we fail. Inevitably, we fail. We're a failure. Inevitably, this is what happens. Once that happens, what happens after you fail? Every single time, it's like clockwork. What happens every single time? We automatically start feeling the guilt and the shame. Every time, we try really, really hard on our own willpower. We try really, really hard, and then our willpower starts to weaken, and then we fail. And every single time, we start feeling terrible for what we've done. I'm such a horrible person. I'm a horrible person. And because we think we're such a horrible person, what does that do? It separates us from God in our own minds. It separates us from God even further. And because we feel separated from God, we try really, really hard again. How many of us do this? We try really, really hard again. I don't know about you, but this explains the entirety of my adulthood. God, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying so hard. And then I don't. And then I fall. 
And then I feel guilty and I feel shameful. I feel like I'm a terrible person. And that makes me want to try even harder the next time. It just creates this cycle of shame that just feels like it feels like it's never ending. Someday we wake up and we start to think, I just can't do this anymore. Man, this is so hard. It's so difficult. I can never be different. There's something wrong with me. There's just something wrong with me. I'm not like everyone else. The devil starts to to speak to us when we start feeling that guilt and shame. And he starts speaking lies to us and starts telling us, you're you're different than everyone else. Nobody else thinks like you think. No one else feels like you feel. You've done too much. You're too far from God. You might as well let go. Give it up because it's never going to work. You might as well just give up now. So we start thinking... We start thinking we're different from anyone else. And we start thinking there's something missing in my life. There's truly something missing in my life. Can I tell you today, it's not something that's missing. It's someone that's missing. And that someone that's missing from your life comes with a power that you do not possess on your own. Stick with me, folks. Listen, the someone that you're missing in your life comes with a supernatural power that you and I do not possess on our own. You don't believe me? Guess what Jesus said? Just think of the I am statements that I just got finished preaching on. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Guess what? We're missing someone in our life because, apart from him, we can do nothing. The Apostle Paul was wrestling with with this distorted identity as well. I need to say this because my wife called me out on this the other day as we were kind of going through my message, and, 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 and she basically was saying, but, but the truth is we are bad. If Apart from Christ, apart from Jesus... Our sinful nature. We are all born into a sinful nature, okay? So we are bad to that extent. But the moment that you accept Jesus as your Savior, you take on the identity of Jesus. You hear me on that? Okay? Apart from Jesus, we are bad. There's no question. We can't save ourselves. We can't help ourselves. Jesus said, you can do nothing apart from me. We are bad apart from Jesus. But the moment, Christian, follower of Jesus, the moment that you surrender your life and put it into his hands, you take on the identity of, the, of Jesus. It's just the way it works. I just needed to say that. I hope that that, that uh, connects with someone here today. But the Apostle Paul, he was wrestling with this identity as well. But then he comes to the truth. He comes to the answer. And the answer is found in the seventh chapter of Romans. He says, who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? And then he goes on to say, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the answer. Listen, folks, it's not about, listen, it's not about behavior modification. It's not. It's not about behavior modification. It's about spiritual transformation. You want to know how to change? You want to know how to, how to do good and do right and do the things that you want to do that you know you're supposed to do? It's not about behavior modification. It's about spiritual transformation. It's about the power that's greater than what you have on your own that's living inside of you and gives you the ability to choose what you want most over what you want right now. That's the way it works. It starts with your identity. It always starts with your identity. The devil wants you to think that you're bad. The devil wants you to think that you are what you did. The devil wants you to think that you are what everyone else says that you are. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are one of his children, you are not what you did. You are not what others say that you are. But you are who God says that you are. And when you know your identity in Him, you know what to do. When you know your identity is in Jesus, you know what to do. It's not about behavior modification. It's about spiritual transformation. And if you belong to Jesus, your identity is in Him. Not in this world. And it's not in your sinful nature. Your identity is in Him. When you recognize that you belong to Jesus, you're no longer a slave 
to your sinful desires, your evil desires. You're filled with the Spirit of God that gives you strength. The Spirit gives you strength to choose what you want most over what you want now. It's the Spirit that gives you that strength, not your willpower. How do you live this out? Like, that's a huge question. Like, how do you live this out? The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he says, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. When you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. But walking by the Spirit is not a one-time event. It's not just, okay, I did it. I walked by the Spirit, so now I'm changed. I'm, I'm free. I'm clear. No, walking by the Spirit is an habitual way of life. It's a habit that you form over a period of time. When you wake up, when you wake up in the morning, you ask the Spirit to give you wisdom for the day. When you wake up in the morning, you ask the Spirit to give you strength to say yes to what you need to say yes to. You ask the Spirit to, to give you the strength to say no to what you need to say no to. It's not your power, but it's the power of Jesus living inside of you through the Holy Spirit. That's how that works. It's not my willpower. It's the power of God that's living inside of me, and I am walking in the Spirit. When we're walking in the Spirit, then God is making those decisions inside of us, not us. And His, will, His power, not our willpower, allows us to do the right thing. I don't know if you're hearing me this morning or not, but His, His power inside of us gives us the strength to do what we could never do in our own willpower. That's what I'm saying. Gives us the strength. Many Christians say, I don't know if you've heard this before or maybe you've said this before, but many Christians say from time to time, I'm going to take a big step of faith right now. I'm going to step out on faith. I know you've probably heard that before. Many Christians say that. I want to step out on faith this time. I'm going to take this big, huge step in faith. Well, guess what you need to do after you take that big, huge step of faith? You need to take another step of faith. And then after you take that step of faith, you need to take another step of faith. And then after that step of faith, you need to take another step of faith. Before long, you're, you're walking in the Spirit because you're walking in faith in God. You see how that works? You don't just take one big step of faith. Every day, you're walking in faith. Paul also says we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We wake up every day and say, um, this, this sounds, to, to many of us, this sounds super undoable. This sounds like we could never do this. But the truth is, God, it's, it's step by step, moment by moment, minute by minute, we're stepping out on faith. We wake up and say, um, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I don't just go to church just to honor him. Yes, I honor him when I go to church, but I need his presence with me every step of the day, every moment of the day. Do we depend on God that much? Do you depend on God that much? You need him with you every step of the way. I need him guiding my thoughts. I need him guiding my thoughts because my mind, it tends to stray and it tends to go in a different direction. I need him moment by moment guiding me because I can't do this on my own. I could never do this on my own. And moment by moment, step by step, it becomes a succession of steps when you're walking in the Spirit of God. And guess what happens? Guess what happens when you start to walk in the Spirit of God? You start to not gratify the desires of the flesh. You start to not gratify the desires of the flesh. I'm walking. I'm walking in the Spirit of God. And guess what? It's walk not run. That means it's going to take time. You have to be patient. Paul says it's you're walking. It's not a run. Paul says, uh, uh, in other words, it's going to take you some time to get there. The cookie tastes really good right now, but it's not what you want most. Sexual sin feels really good in the moment, but it's not what you really need. It's not all desires of the flesh feel good in the moment, but the greater reward always takes time. The greater reward always takes time. What do you want most? You want a godly marriage? You want to stop arguing with your spouse? You want to lose weight? You want to get closer to God? What is it that you're looking for that is the greater reward? A meaningful ministry? What is it? The greater reward always takes time. 
It's walking in the Spirit, depending on God, day by day, moment by moment, leads to the greater reward. Listen, if you belong to Jesus today, if you belong to Jesus today, I want you to, if you're online right now, I want you to type in the comments, I belong to Jesus. If you're in this space with me today and you belong to Jesus, I want you to declare out loud right now, I belong to Jesus. Can y'all say it with me? I belong to Jesus. One more time. I belong to Jesus. Listen, if you declared that this morning, that is your identity. Can I say that again? If you belong to Jesus, your identity is in Jesus Christ. That is your identity. And that is so important that you understand because when you understand your identity, it breaks the cycle of shame. When you understand your identity, it breaks the cycle of shame. Instead of try hard and your willpower starts to weaken and you fail and then you start to feel guilty or feel shameful, instead of that, you know what happens when you know your identity? You know who you are in Jesus Christ? It starts to look something like this. When you know I belong to Jesus, that becomes the foundation of who you are. That becomes the foundation of who you are. And so when you belong to Jesus, you say, I depend on Jesus for everything. You know those folks in your life right now. You know people in your life right now that say, I depend on Jesus for everything. And you want to be one of those people as well. We all want to be one of those people. I depend on Jesus for everything. I depend on the Spirit for everything. And you know what that does? It builds my faith in God. When I depend on Jesus or the Spirit for everything, it builds my faith in God. And then what happens at that point? It helps me make right decisions. Or take right actions, right? That's what happens when I de- depend on the Spirit for everything. It builds my faith and helps me make the right choices or take the right actions. And you know what happens once we take the right actions and our, our faith, it brings me closer to God. You see what this cycle does? I depend on the Spirit for everything and it builds my faith. It empowers right actions and then it helps me to grow closer to God. That ultimately helps me to depend on the Spirit even more. You see how that works? I would much rather want this cycle and live in this cycle than that cycle of shame. I want to depend on God more. I want to depend on the Spirit more because I want this instead of the cycle of shame. Identity drives actions and actions create rewards. When you understand your identity, it changes everything. When you understand who you are in Christ, it changes everything. When you belong to Jesus, listen, When you belong to Jesus, you don't just read your Bible because that's what everybody tells you to do. And that's what the pastor says to read your Bible. So I must need to read my Bible. You don't read your Bible out of a chore when you belong to Jesus. You read your Bible because you want to get to know Jesus more. You want to get to know God more. You don't pray when you belong to Jesus and you know your identity. You don't pray just because you're taught that you have to pray every day. You pray because you want to get to know God on a deeper level. When you, when you know who you belong to, then you know what to do. When you belong to Jesus, you can choose what you want most over what you want now by walking in the Spirit of God. I want to ask Michael to come up and Chandler. Listen, you need to understand this. I'm excited. I'm setting up Michael for next week. Michael's actually going to be preaching next week, and, and this is a good setup sermon so that he can preach what God has put on his heart throughout this sermon series for next week. But here's what I want to say to you right now. None of us have the willpower to be who God has called us to be. None of us. I'm freeing you from that thought today that says, if I just try harder, I can be who God wants me to be. None of us have the willpower to be who God has called us to be. Not a single one of us. We just don't have it in us. I'm going to let you in on a little secret, and it's a life-changing secret. Check this out. Do you want more self-control? I don't know anyone that would say no, okay? You don't have to shake your head. You don't have to raise your hand or comment online. Do you want more self-control? Do you want more discipline in your life? Do you know what these things are? Paul calls these fruits of the Spirit. He doesn't say that self self, um, uh, or willpower and discipline, self-control, he doesn't say that those are things um, or fruits of the willpower, does it? 
He says they're fruits of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says that these are fruits of the Spirit, not fruits of our willpower. So, what do we do now? What do you do with this? How do you, how do you deal with this knowledge? All I'm asking you to do today, this is all I want from you today. I want you to ask yourself a question. Just ask a simple question. What do I want most? Not what I want now, but I want you to ask yourself the question, what do I want most? And I want you to take it a step further. I don't want you to just ask, what do I want most? I want you to ask yourself the question, who do I want to become? Who do I want to become? Because that's what you want most. Who do I want to become? Name it. I don't not out loud right now or not online, but just name it inside of yourself. Who do I want to become? And then every single day, every single day, wake up. Wake up and 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 claim your identity. Who am I in Christ? I belong to Jesus, therefore I can do A, B, or C. I belong to Jesus, therefore I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I belong to Jesus, therefore the Spirit living inside of me can help me do what I need to do most over what I want to do right now. And listen, moment by moment, day by day, step by step, you start walking in the Spirit of God. You start walking in faith and trusting Him for everything. And as you're walking in, in, in faith, guess what you want to do? You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. You start looking and working for the greater reward. God's Spirit in you helps you choose what you want most over what you want now. Answer that question. Answer that question this morning. What do I want most? Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this glorious opportunity that you've given us to be in your house or to be watching online today. I thank you, God, that through your spirit we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. That through your spirit we have the power that we could never have on our own. That by your spirit, God, we have the strength to be who you've called us to be. Through you, not our own selves. We don't have the power inside of us in our own. We don't have the power inside of us to save ourselves. We don't have the power inside of us to do good. That power comes from you. That strength comes from you. And so I pray today that if there's anyone that's watching online or anyone that's in this, this room today that have never surrendered their lives to you, help them to understand that with you and in you, comes a supernatural power for them to do things that they could never do on their own. You change us from the inside out, God. And we're so thankful for that. Father, we love you th so much and we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Son, your, your Son and our Savior. And in your name we pray. Folks, would you please stand with me for a moment? We're going to worship God with a song. Chandler's going to lead us. And it's, man, it's such a beautiful song. And I just want you to understand the first verse of this song is written from the perspective of us talking to God. The second verse of this song is written from the perspective of God talking back to us. Beautiful opportunity for us to worship Him. But if you have something on your heart today, something that you've said and you all throughout this sermon, you've been saying, I've tried so hard, I've tried so hard, I've tried so hard, but I keep failing. I'm asking you today, leave it here at the altar. The altar is open. You're welcome to come down and pray at any point. You're welcome to.
stand at your seat and worship God. You're welcome to sit. You're welcome to do whatever God is calling you to do in this moment. But I just want you to answer the question, what do you want most? What do you want most? Let's sing. try again oh child would you try again my child you can love again amen thank you Chandler thank you Michael would you guys have a seat just for a moment um Listen, I just, we have something we prepared that I want to give to you guys. It's a resource and it helps you with your identity, okay? Um, there's just some things on here um, that we kind of wrote down that helps you find out who you are in Christ. And when you know who you are in Christ, you know what to do. And when the enemy starts to tell you that you're not worthy, that you're not worth it, that, you're, you're too, that you've gone too far, that you've done too much, God says different. And you can tell the enemy, that's not who God says that I am. At the top of this, it says, I belong to Jesus. Therefore, in Christ, I renounce the lie that I'm rejected, unloved, dirty, or shameful. Because in Christ, I'm completely accepted. God says that in John chapter 1, verse 12, I am a child of God. Or, I have been bought with a price. Therefore, I belong to God. 
I've been adopted as God's child. I've been redeemed and forgiven for all of my sins. And then Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, I am complete in Christ. This is just a little resource that we have for you guys. Right now, they're sitting on the table out there by the, the box where you give your offering at the end of the hallway. I want you guys to pick up one of these blue papers, take it home with you, put it on your refrigerator, keep it in your heart so that you know who you are in Christ. He gives you the strength that you need to go for what you want most over what you want now. Thank you guys so much for being with us again today. Uh, Tonight at 6 o'clock, I just want to mention our student ministry. They're going to be meeting here at the church. Uh, If you have kids that are in 6th grade all the way through 12th grade, come out and be with us tonight. Um, We will not be doing Connect this Wednesday. My wife and my kids and I, we're going to be out of town. We're going to take this Wednesday off with our Connect group, and we're going to meet back next Wednesday night to conclude Connect. And then I want to announce to you today that we are super excited. In the coming weeks, we're going to be talking to you about what's next uh, for groups, Ridgepoint groups. We're going to be meeting back together soon. And over the next couple weeks, I'm going to be revealing what that's going to look like and how that's going to happen. So I'm excited because we need community, guys. All of us need community with each other. We need more opportunities to get together. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about what that looks like. This is our opportunity to give as you exit the sanctuary today. Um, On your right at the end of the hallway is our offering box along with these papers. Um, And so today, if you're ready to give and you want to give and uh, give to what God is doing through Ridgepoint Church, I would encourage you to do so. You can also do that online anytime at ridgepoint.net forward slash give. God bless you guys. Thank you for being with us today. Um, Just need to mention, if you have kids, um, if you'll exit the sanctuary, if you have toddlers or um, first through fifth grade, make sure that you go to your right as soon as you exit the sanctuary through that single door to... Uh, If you have first through fifth graders, if you have toddlers, go all the way down to the end of the hallway, turn right, and go in the same way that you probably drop your child off. If you have preschool or nursery kids, go on back out to kids check-in. You can pick up your kids there, okay? God bless you guys. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great afternoon.